work together, uh, but I don't think I properly ever heard the story of how you joined ERA and what that was like in the 70s, uh, because, um, you know, in my mind, that seemed to be kind of like the glory period of theme parks, at least in the U.S., and that's when Disney was building Disney World and um, theme parks were just starting to kind of open around the world as well. So, um, you know, it, you were there from the beginning. So I, I, I'd i love to hear just, you know, like uh, uh, briefly about how you came to join ERA and, you know, what that was like and what, what the, the general period was like. So the beginning, uh, I wasn't, tr truth be told, I wasn't uh, really there for, for the very beginning, the very beginning uh was launched by walt disney and and uh and uh this amazing guy named uh harrison buzz price mm -hmm. um they uh walt invited uh the buzz to help him figure out how to do it and where to do it build disneyland mm -hmm. and, uh, so he started he did that and then walt said you know you're you're pretty good at this uh why don't you start your own company? And because uh, he had been at Stanford Research Institute mm -hmm. uh, at the very outset when they found the site in Anaheim. Um, and he uh, uh, started ERA. And that group, that was in, I think started ERA, Disneyland opened in 55. Mm -hmm. uh, started ERA, I think in 58 or something like that. Just sure. Not long later after. And eventually brought a lot, lot some other uh, partners in on that, and and ERA grew into an extensive uh, land use economics uh, uh, firm, consultant mm -hmm. firm. Um, I actually joined in '71 because I thought uh, I wanted to be a uh, you know real estate develop real estate development. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I joined in. You know, after a while of working on various projects, real estate projects and other, uh, I saw that the guys at the other end of the shop were working on entertainment projects and they were having more fun. So I, yeah. I should try, I should get involved in that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I did. And uh, that led to me getting, be very involved in that and eventually becoming the head of the practice as Buzz moved on to uh, other uh, pursuits. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's that's how it started. Mm -hmm. uh, became head of the entertainment practice by for 25 years or some number of years like that. Um, mm -hmm. And for the whole firm, and uh, uh, we we you know were dominant in in mm -hmm. the field of uh, entertainment, uh, uh, real estate uh, development projects. Right. And uh, literally, just about everybody, you and. I <laughs> included uh, sort of came from that yeah. wellspring of, of uh, the early days of ERA. Mm -hmm. You know, all, all of the competitors out there. Sure. After a while, uh, we'll talk about some projects and stuff that we've done in the interim, but uh, uh, after a while, we ended up selling ERA. We want to jump to that chapter mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, AECOM. Mm -hmm. That was in 2007. Yeah. 2010, several of us, myself, Matt Ernest, Christian Owen, Ed Shaw, uh, decided to uh, leave a, a day conversion of ERA and uh, start a different company, ECA. Mm -hmm. And ECA, uh, trading shamelessly on the name, the brand of ERA, sure. um, we, uh, we uh, wanted to have a a practice focused on, uh, you know, continuing the 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 practice that we had and the clients that we had and all that. Yeah. Uh, but just focus on that. ERA did several other things, you know, with real estate and resort development and uh, city redevelopment projects, things like that. Right. We just wanted to have a specific focus on uh, entertainment development economics. Yeah. Yeah. Entertainment, and as we talk about, it, we'll talk about that maybe a little later. Mm -hmm. The culture part. Sure, sure. Understood. Th thanks for the um, the overview. In the quick, 70s, quick, uh, quick uh, recap of 50 some years. Yeah, sure. So when you first joined, were you working on like Disney World? Because that's when, 
that was all going on uh, back in the 70s. Yeah, no, but it, right. I joined, I joined in 71 and, and the Disney world uh, the planning stuff was uh, was started earlier. It was started like in the mid 60s. And, and right. The addition of all that 27,000 acres and, and all that. Uh, one of my colleagues, you'll remember Austin Anderson, he, mm -hmm. his very first job at ERA, as he tells the story, uh, he's a little older than me. Mm -hmm. uh, than I am. Uh, he he says his very first job was the economic impact of Disney World on the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And so he walked right into it. Uh, and then he went on to real estate and, uh, and I did. Yeah. Yeah. Into the, into the entertainment side. So what were some of your, your first projects in, in the uh, entertainment practice? Well, some of the very first ones weren't, weren't that notable, but I'll talk about the you know some early projects to give mm -hmm. you a sense of that um uh i um well several favorites uh mm -hmm. I, I i worked worked uh with elish gardens in denver so i'll start with that project mm -hmm. uh, i was working on something else in denver a fairgrounds project mm -hmm. up north or in adams county north of denver Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we're looking at d different uh, options of what to do with that property. And one of the ideas was maybe some kind of theme park. Well, in right. those days there, there there was a there were two amusement parks in in Denver. One was Elish Gardens, and the, the fourth it was on the fourth generation of family ownership, the, mm -hmm. the Gertler family. And uh, as part of my project of not working for them, but for this. Uh, a government uh, agency uh, north of Denver. Mm -hmm. I went and called on the Girdlers and said, you know, one great idea we have is is, is to look at uh, maybe doing a theme park up here. You're the established, you know, classic theme amusement park in in, in Denver, but uh, you're very much hemmed in by uh, uh, I forget the how many acres it had, but it wasn't very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and uh, but had the classic roller coaster and, and a great history. Mm -hmm. um, so I started talking to them, and they said, "No, no, no, we're fine." But then after a couple of years, they called me back and said, "You know, we talked to you about this this, this kind of thing. So mm -hmm. maybe we ought to look at that." So for years, we looked at where the best site would be. Uh, and I was part of that process. Uh, we were very close to the new one down to the south, or a, a location south of Denver. But uh, uh, we. Settled on on uh, this incredible property right in the middle of part of uh, Denver, right along the river, mm -hmm. uh, the rail yards um, that had a lot of contamination issues and stuff. But, uh, sure. They worked out a very complicated land deal, and we're able to build a park right in adjacent to downtown Denver. Right. Uh, and so that was uh, really interesting. That that all took place over the ten or fifteen years. Of, wow. of working with them. Yeah, long, yeah. long, long duration to be realized. And then, of course, eventually it got so uh, pretty early on, it got sold to Six Flags. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and that was that. Yeah. So, do you remember how, how that land acquisition process works? I mean, it, it being so close to um, downtown Denver, I, I imagine that would have run into a lot of challenges. Well, it, because it was it was a rail yard, mm -hmm. it was the big switching yard in in, in Denver, uh, Burlington Northern and, and other uh, rail, railroads, mm -hmm. um, Santa Fe. I forget the ones. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, it was it was a great asset for Denver being so close, and so they were very involved, uh, and had. Uh, uh, we ended up building a stadium there and an arena and 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 the amusement park. Um, mm -hmm. And it was uh, it was complicated, and there was a lot of contamination, and the city had to sort of indemnify uh, the the the, the uh, cleanup of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's fortunate it worked out as well as it did. Yeah, yeah, understood. I thought, I thought it was an absolutely awesome. Uh, site and, and the idea of doing that in a music park back mm -hmm. in the of amusement slash theme park it wasn't really quite a full theme park but uh, mm -hmm. uh, a big amusement park uh, in the middle of a 
in the city. Mm -hmm. So it's a little Tivoli Gardens ish, but you know, yeah. it wasn't, wasn't quite that urban, but I used to yeah. have to draw to it. But. Sure, sure. So in general, what was what were those early days like um, in in terms of like how different it is from now? Um, so it, could you paint a picture of what the, you know, like the 1970s and early 1980s were like? I mean, it, it, Disney was just opening Disney World and Universal was just getting started. And, and even the regional parks were just getting started, I think. Yeah, it was it was a, 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 a sort of a rush. Of, of activity um i don't, I don't know we, we recognize it as such then but certainly the the you know disney disney set the stage the disneyland and then i i like to say well disney taught us everything we need to know about theme parks mm -hmm. right? first of all number one he invented theme parks with disney mm -hmm. number two he built disney world taught us that that building a destination is better than building a park. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea of sell, selling several days instead of several hours sure. uh, is much more, uh, uh, much more higher revenue potential. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, but that really hadn't, that concept that he was ahead of the time with of building the complete destination mm -hmm. hadn't caught on in any way yet. I mean, it was still the, the act. The big story of the 70s and 80s was building regional parks and all of the markets big enough in the United States mm -hmm. and some elsewhere. But um, the the uh, so you had the you had the rise of Six Flags. Pardon me. Um, uh, Six Flags really only built three parks. You know, mm -hmm. they built it built first Texas and then Atlanta and then Mid America, and then they acquired everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so there, that they became a chain of regional parks. Uh, there were a lot of other independent parks that were built. There was, you know, Opryland and that, but uh, and, and several others. But but the uh, the Kings group, group that was actually Tap Broadcasting built the first park, their first park in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, then they built King's Dominion, and uh, eventually that got rolled up with several other parks, Carowinds and some others, into uh, uh, what was called King's Entertainment, which became Paramount Parks, uh, and then got rolled into some other parks with into the Cedar Fair, um, uh, you know, Cedar Point, Cedar Fair group. Um, so that, but that all that consolidation all came later. That's another another story. The, the, mm -hmm. But the real thrust was was uh, sort of entrepreneurial people or or organizations, uh, you know, building a park to service their region, their, mm -hmm. their area. You know, the old uh, fifty and hundred mile radius mm -hmm. kind of research kind of. Sure, system. sure. When did you first start seeing activity from um, international um, clients? Uh, we had, well, you know, Buzz had done a number of things with with some old line European guys, uh, mm -hmm. and then in some of that some of that carried over. You know, the old, you know, uh, the, the Max uh, Europa Park and right. Uh, 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 Daftaling and, and, and some of those mm -hmm. uh, we saw so it was, it was kind of a European story then eventually mm -hmm. uh, there seemed, seemed to be a, a, a little bit of action in, in Asia and, and um, of course Disney again led the way with, with Tokyo uh, Disneyland mm -hmm. um, we saw I'm trying to remember the exact you know, the sequence in, in years um, did several things in Japan. I started in in the eighties, mm -hmm. looking you know doing things in Japan. Japan was, um, you know, having a real surge. Remember the whole trophy property stuff. Yeah, buying uh, at right. every, and they wanted to build uh, uh, theme parks in in Japan. Mm -hmm. Um, and then and then a real uh, notable time came in nineteen eighty seven. I got an, a, a called on by um, 
this uh, very wealthy family from Hong Kong, overseas Chinese uh, family, Dr. Guang Chik Lim. Uh, mm -hmm. He had uh, made his fortune in uh, having left, coming out of China, mm -hmm. uh, set, establishing himself in, in Hong Kong and in Malaysia, made his money as a hard, in hardwood timber down in, in, in Sabah region. Mm -hmm. Of, uh, of Malaysia, Malaysia yeah. in Malaysia, um, being an overseas Chinese in that in that early era when when they started just just started to have those joint venture laws in uh, in China, uh, enabling uh, uh, outside money to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, it was always Party A and Party B. Party A was the Chinese government. Party B was sort of the sucker uh, overseas uh, money. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, because in those days there weren't very many rules about yeah. how it worked in China. Right. So we had a we we did this phenomenal project in China in Beijing. Um that was an 800 acre site uh in Chaoyang district, which is the robust growth district on mm -hmm. the east on, yeah. on the east side of uh, Beijing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was uh, uh called Shui Twin Park, but it became Chaoyang Park. Um, and we looked at building uh, a theme park there and, and a lot of development in the public park and, and uh, also a movie studio. But mm -hmm. that, was, that was to be the ambition of the project. But it, it actually, um, it became a, a very substantial development opportunity for Cheyenne District and, mm -hmm. and a, a big public park. I mean, it's a very mm -hmm. nice public park in Cheyenne, Beijing, but... Uh, but anyway, that opened the door for us to to start to look at China. And there started to be a, uh, with some fits and starts, of course, mm -hmm. 1989, Tiananmen Square slowed slowed the roll there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Outside development could do, mm -hmm. but uh, eventually that took hold, and uh, that I would say that became a very big driver of, of, of our business. Um, is all of the history of the development in China. Right. So I say, you know, first Japan, uh, first Europe, and then and then Japan, then and then Southeast Asia and China kind of together. Yeah, I see. Well, well, now that we're on that topic, um, so how how did you see China evolve um, as a as a destination for for, for theme parks and, and theme park development? Well, I had a huge interest. In, in, in having that kind of development. And, and the real driving force for it to become such a pervasive development uh, uh, program in, in China, theme parks in general, mm -hmm. in, uh, industry, um, is that it was, it was a way for, for developers to get land. Right. They would come in with, with the promise of, we're gonna build a theme park and, and, and it was cultural tourism, we're gonna, we're going to promote cultural tourism to your city, mm -hmm. wherever it is. You know, Chengdu, yeah. Xi'an, any, any of all of the all of the uh, sort of very significant cities in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there, there were the, the very aggressive real estate developers, and, and uh, they would get they would they would get land for a theme park. They built they they and they'd, sometimes they built the theme park, sometimes they didn't, but they built. Thousands and thousands and thousands of apartments. Yeah, crazy. Right. But some, but some, you know, some some uh, 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 chains grew out of that. Some, mm -hmm. some groupings of theme parks. OCT, mm -hmm. OCT Chinese Town was 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 one of the more aggressive ones. Phantom mm -hmm. Wild. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a number of them now that um, that mostly develop their own stuff. Unlike mm -hmm. in the US, where most of the, chains in the US ended up acquiring other properties. Right. But it was this this very robust real estate program that uh, really drove it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and it, in your view of um, which operators were able to survive and, and which kind of just fell uh, by the wayside? Uh, do you have any observations there? Like, wh why were, you know, over the last 30 years in China, as some some of the theme parks were able to survive and, and some just didn't at all. Yeah. Well, and, and there were some very poor uh, 
developments, you know, very inadequate. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it was it was such a hot topic topic in in uh, in China that that uh, you know just about anything be ca was called a theme park. Yeah. I went. To, you know, they list two. two 2000 early on they listed 2000 theme parks in china and i saw a bunch of them and you know they were like like a, a, a few boats in a marina <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, uh you know a, a, a restaurant or something and, and yeah it, it was um, not what we would consider to be theme parks in mm -hmm. most, of, most of those things so um so a lot of stuff fell by the wayside, and and and, and you know the, the shortfall was was a very poor development, lack of economics, um, not really building the product that was uh, it would be sufficient. So hmm. yeah, it would, there was a lot of shoddy stuff. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And uh, as part of your work in um, China, I, I know that you worked on Universal Studios Beijing. Um, could you, yeah, yeah, could you talk about like your involvement with Universal in general? Because it, it seemed, you know, as one of the top two operators in the world, I think you have a you have a great experience and background with Universal in general. Yes, we certainly uh, we have. Uh, oh, oh, I had a long history with Universal, with both ERA and ECA. Mm -hmm. You know, it was probably our biggest client revenue wise over all those years yeah. um, um and that involved working in the early days working here with project with the projects in the u.s but eventually um we 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 became uh, you know the, the the group that would do the, the all of the work for their international development mm -hmm. and uh I think all all of the all of the ones we looked in several locations in one in in Europe. That was probably the first thing we did because hmm. Universal has always wanted to be in Europe. Um, uh, and then Beijing is a great story because Beijing um, we were hired in in I think it was the year two thousand. It opened in twenty twenty one. Universal Beijing. Uh -huh. so, we we're hiring year 2000 to look at totally separate studies, very complete, extensive, comprehensive, detailed studies of Beijing and Shanghai. And Disney was in the running, of course, we know for mm -hmm. uh, for for, uh, and they focused on Shanghai. But they looked over other other places too. But for Universal, we had two two assignments, two big projects. Mm -hmm. And, and one was uh, Shanghai. Um, and uh, they, they were they were very focused on on they select selected Shanghai and and still you know there was still a, a sort of a secret uh, competition between mm -hmm. Disney and and, and, and uh, Universal. Um, but they went you know down the road uh, in trying to do the project and had selected a site and uh, were in, took two years of negotiation uh, of what all they were, who was doing what uh, uh, on it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then they, then Disney sort of blocked the door, took, took, took the Shanghai market. Uh -huh. um, and it was, all, it was always sort of a, a little bit of a, a race. Uh -huh. And then, so then we looked, Several other locations for uh, uh, for the Universal Park in China, mm -hmm. including going back to Beijing and looking again. Yeah, and at that time, Beijing, like in the twenty two thousand eight two thousand nine, maybe mm -hmm. uh, went back to Beijing, and Beijing didn't want to have. <clears throat> they were still considered Beijing to be the sort of the cultural jewel of China, so they didn't want to have. An American movie theme. Mm -hmm. huh. um, so we looked in, you know, Guangzhou and some other places, and ever eventually came back to Beijing under the with the banner of the Beijing Tourism Authority as a partner. They were a partner earlier, but I think they just had somehow overcame this cultural uh, uh, dilemma. Yeah, and uh, went uh, you know went ahead with the project. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so, 21 year process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you think it took so long? That that I mean, it usually. Well, you know, looking at five right. different sites, and you know, changing your whole thrust. Uh, you can't, you can't you know just you know with the investment with partners and all that stuff. You don't just yeah. do that on a, on, a, on a heel pivot. You gotta. Sure. You gotta it takes years to yeah. get a partner and, and a site. Um, uh, so yeah. Uh, and that in you know Disney, Disney got the Shanghai market, and so they were looking everywhere else, and they had to, they had to talk Beijing into it. And it took a while. Yeah, yeah, mm. okay. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know all the ins and outs, of course, but the, from what I could observe, it was, mm -hmm. it was yeah. a trying process. Yep. Sure. <laughs> yeah. It, but, um, yeah. And then. Well, in addition to Universal, um, you've helped kind of create some, you know, the, some of the concepts um, for operators like Legoland and Kidzania. C could you talk oh, about yeah, right. like, you know, being at the being at the birth of those concepts as LBE concepts? Yeah, I think well, I think it's interesting sort of the evolution of of of, uh, of LBE because, mm -hmm. you know, the the early early days of, of of first there were theme parks there were theme parks are, right. uh, like say the top of the pyramid of entertainment development projects because it's you know the biggest and most expensive and in in, in in modern theme parks they they use the use of ip and sure. you know very, very important components like that um so uh, theme parks really set the stage and a lot of stuff sprang out of that you know mm -hmm. i mean it was it was certainly the model that led to water parks and <clears throat> and the growth of various forms of LBE. You know, still mm -hmm. were family entertainment centers, but sort sure. of sort of the transition to maybe more branded entertainment centers, um, indoor attractions. Mm -hmm. So along the way, the two the two biggest uh, uh, the best models for a rollout, a global ro rollout of LBE components. The best ones you can cite really are Merlin with their what they call their midway attractions. They have a bundle of them. You know, <laughs> start out with Magic Soaps, then they acquired Sea Life Aquariums, uh, and uh, then they had to deal with Lego for the Legoland Discovery Centers. Mm -hmm. um, and they've got a, 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 several other things. They have the Eye, um, uh, the Slim Giant. Uh, yeah. Uh, and several others, and uh, I, I I don't know what they're up to now, but there's probably there's probably 150 plus units. Yeah, six of those kinds of, of those five or six uh, 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 products. Um, so and we had we had worked with we we would work with Merlin before it was Merlin, and it was mm -hmm. Tussauds Group and. Charter House, and and then it was you know it was Merlin uh, uh, set up a very uh, very well run organization mm -hmm. uh, with having the theme park sector and the LBE sector as sort of a balanced portfolio. Mm -hmm. We worked with with them. Well, we worked with Tussauds and helped them be sold and rolled up into what became Merlin. Mm -hmm. uh, then they made their deal with Lego. So that they end up having two kinds of parks. You know, we have the Alton Towers, Chessington, Thorpe Park kind of uh, amusement parks in in uh, in Europe. Then they acquired several others like uh, Heidi Park and and uh, uh, Gardaland in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, then they had they had to deal with to develop the Lego Land parks. But I want to back up a minute. So yes. uh, Lego getting in the business. I, I, how did how did Lego get in the theme park business? Yeah. Well, that story is that I was giving a talk in anticipation in 1990 or something like that. Euro Disneyland opened in 92. Um, I was giving a talk in the south of France, uh, sort of to the European amusement community. Mm -hmm. um, and after you know, and the purpose of the talk was, you know, 
you know, you, you should embrace your Disneyland because you know it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna raise the tide, yeah. uh, rise the rise the tide, um, and uh, you can it, you got to you got to invest and you got to upgrade yourself, but uh, it can make it can benefit you a great deal and expand the industry. Sure, that was the talk, and it, after I gave my talk, um, it was in Cannes or Nice or someplace like that. Um, there's six, six young uh, uh, Scandinavian guys, middle-aged and young, um, came uh, walking down uh, uh, to talk to me after the talk, and and they were the sort of the advanced team from from Lego, mm -hmm. uh, and and Lego had a, a little amusement park at their headquarters factory area in Billund, uh, Denmark. <coughs> Uh, and, and it was sort of, it evolved as a historical accident. You know, people came knocking on the door and said, does this really make Lego bricks, you know, and, and can we see them? And so they made a little place for them and it grew to a little amusement park and, uh. and, and then it grew to a, you know, you know a, a reasonably sized amusement park. Mm -hmm. uh, so very immature. Yeah. Uh, and, and when the first time I went there and uh, uh, they... But they wanted to. They wanted to get in the business somehow in a more uh, aggressive way. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, we we had several workshops and, and things about what what should be should it be something mall based, mm -hmm. exhibit based, uh, yeah. um, or a theme parks. And so you know, we 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 were part of the process to help them think. Well, theme park would be the way to go. Yeah. And, uh, so we helped do strategy for them uh, and, and how they would go about a rollout, both in Europe and in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and and that led to a pretty pretty robust product. First, was, yeah. first new product was Windsor, <clears throat> and then and then uh, Carlsbad, January. Yeah. Um, and it went from there. We helped them put together the first foray into Asia, which was in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. On the very southern tip of Malaysia near Singapore. Mm -hmm. And yeah, my gosh. Uh, ECA is looking at five new sites, I think, right now for uh, mm -hmm. for uh, Lego Land in China. Um so uh yeah, so they they then then they then they brought that in uh the Lego toy company actually got in a little the financial trouble for a while and they had to uh <coughs> excuse me, join up with uh, Merlin for the development of the parks and operation. Right. And uh, and they uh, so they become uh, paired up. Uh, by the way, Lego has dramatically recovered their toy business and they're mm -hmm. very, very strong. Uh, mm -hmm. now. And actually bought back some of the, some of the park, you know, some of the, the ownership of the park. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was, that's a little bit of the Lego story. The sure. Kidzania story is this really amazing entrepreneur named Javier Lopez, uh, along with some partners down in, in Mexico, Mexico City, mm -hmm. <laughs> just on their own, built uh, uh, the, the original Kidzania sure. at a shopping mall in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Mexico City, Santa Fe, uh, sort of an upscale shopping mall, and and uh, they thought, well, maybe this this has uh, power beyond Mexico City, and so uh, actually, I think first originally they had Buzz go down there and look at it, and, and then Buzz referred him to me, mm -hmm. and I went down uh, to visit with him, and uh, we ended up sort of helping them strategize their rollout. Mm -hmm. Starting with the U.S. Um, and then the idea to go international. Um, as it turned out, uh, they didn't do the U.S. rollout. Uh, uh, it was they were they were had a very interesting financing program that they thought that uh, you know with this with the magic the magic potion in Kazania is that they get all this sponsorship of yep. all the different activities that you do inside of the children's theme park. Right. Sort of the career, um, uh, 
pavilions. <laughs> and so they thought that they could get the sponsorship paid in advance and and some tenant improvements from the from the mall operators that they would go to, and they would they could finance it that way. And that didn't really sell in the U.S. at that time. Mm. So they uh, Javier uh, adopted a uh, a different strategy internationally. He didn't try to do it with his own money. He he did it on a franchise basis. And so he first went to Japan and uh, uh, very successfully opened, uh, got a partner mm -hmm. in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. uh, and then little by little all over, I think they're up, up to pushing 30 units yeah. around the world, just now trying to get into, uh, into the U.S. Yeah. So anyway, I'm a great admirer of, of uh, Javier and what, what he's done, really invented a uh, mm -hmm. really great product. Yeah, yeah. Been, been very successful with it, rolling it on. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, going back to the um, what you were saying about uh, seeing the evolution of LBE, um, mm -hmm. could, you, could you talk about um, how you've seen the evolution of entertainment retail as well? Oh, yeah, well, um, that that was a big deal. That was a big strategic move that we made <clears throat> at ERA because we talked about the regional theme parks. Yeah. Uh, the real spurt of building regional theme parks in the and, 70s and 80s. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you sort of run out of markets. Right. How many can you do? Yeah. Right? And uh, um, so... So the industry was kind of looking for the for the next product. Um, and at the same time, uh, uh, commercial real estate uh, was was uh, looking for things to do to differentiate and add to uh, uh, malls and 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 create a better stronger uh, visitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was a lot of interest at that time and. <clears throat> there were a couple of formative projects that I worked on that, that really informed that sort of push to blend entertainment with retail. Yeah. Um, one was called Yerba Buena Gardens. Mm -hmm. uh, started working on that in 1980 um, when we did this sort of this RFP process. Uh, we were part of it, the city mm -hmm. uh, to put on an RFP to develop a mega, mega, mega downtown urban project in San Francisco. And it was between, you know, downtown San Francisco, between 3rd and 4th, yeah, between uh, uh, Market Street and uh, Howard, and below three blocks. Yeah, and That's where they built the Moscone Center, and they built the Moscone Center underground, so we could build this Yerba Buena Gardens project on top. Mm -hmm. And so we selected uh, uh, the Reichman, uh, what was their name? Olympia, New York, mm -hmm. to be the master developer. Uh, and the purpose, uh, the way we wrote the RFP for, to get them to be the master developer was it was the first urban renewal, urban redevelopment project that anyone was aware of, where the driving force was what we call the CARE uses, C A R E, cultural, amusement, recreation, entertainment. Mm -hmm. Those were to be the drivers of this. Of course, there was a 1,500-room Marriott Hotel, yeah. and 800-room other hotel, and a million and a half square-foot office building, and things like that, along yeah. the market. Yeah. But, but the rest of it was to be a park and, and, uh, and an entertainment zone, which eventually became an you know, entertainment retail piece, eventually became a metro. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Sony Pictures, which had had missed out on the theme park boom, mm -hmm. um, was adamant. We hired a bunch of ex-Disney guys. They were adamant about being in the business of entertainment retail. So the next wave. Right. So they brought in people from Disney. And they did the Metreon. Uh, they did Hot Summer Plots in Berlin. Uh, and they did, uh, what was the third one? I'm blanking. I think there's a third one. Okay. Uh, and it's Sony, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Was, and I was on the selection committee uh, uh, for that uh, for the city to pick who was who would who would develop that piece of the project. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I was in, there were two two final bidders, and I was actually an advocate of the other bidder, <laughs> um, which was a which was a real estate developer, and there because their approach was three hundred fifty thousand square feet of uh, commercial space in downtown, uh, in a fabulous market downtown San Francisco, uh, and uh, well, let's find three hundred fifty thousand square feet of people who were in that business of you know tenants who were mm -hmm. the best best uh, to do those things. Sony's approach was 350,000 feet of development opportunity in downtown San Francisco. Let's figure out 350,000 square feet of new things that we can develop and new, new attraction ideas. And yep. you know, of course, they had the movies and some restaurants and stuff. But they had tried to do a lot of new attraction ideas that were unproven and, and um, ultimately didn't work very well. Mm, I see. So, so uh, but anyway, those kind of projects were happening. Uh, uh, your winter gardens. Another one I could mention would be Blockbuster Park, um, which which the Blockbuster Entertainment Company was uh, in the early '90s was uh, owned by or was run by this guy named Wayne Isaac, an amazing man, maybe the only guy I've ever heard of to to create three Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. First was Waste Management, and then was Blockbuster, and then was uh, it's called Republic Industries. It was an amalgamation of several different yeah. companies. Um, Wait, so but, this was the same? Uh, is this the blockbuster, the video rental company? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Before you know, before it tanked, uh -huh. Wayne was very, Wayne Heisinger was a very smart guy. Yeah, and he saw the writing on the wall. Yeah, you know that that the streaming was coming eventually, and sure, and having a store with these, these yeah set boxes wasn't going to last forever so so um he was looking at other things at the time he owned the professional sports market in, in south florida mm -hmm. he owned the miami dolphins mm -hmm. he owned the uh, uh the uh, uh marlins baseball team and he owned the panthers uh hockey team mm -hmm. and he wanted to build a new didn't like the arena that the that, uh, he didn't own the basketball team. That was maybe there else. Um, but uh, he, he owned the other three teams, and he, he wanted to he wanted to build a new baseball stadium. He wanted to build a, a new arena for the hockey and hockey team. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also owned Joe Robbie Stadium, which is where the Dolphins play. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I we I worked with him to look at how to do that. And he had all these ideas about about how you blend sports mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, uh, other other forms of entertainment and retail yeah. uh, as, as an anchor. And you know, he sees his idea was, you know, people come come early to the game, stay late after, have a drink or some, something. Um, and it was sort of like an expanded fan fest idea. It was his, it was his notion, but we sort of looked at it and said, you know, the place to do that is not Joe Robbie Stadium. There wasn't enough land mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't ambitious enough for it. It may not have been the best part of town to do it in. So eventually, we Wayne had, had a lot of power in those days in Florida. He found uh, and what started to buy the 3,000, 3,500 acre property right at the border between Dade and Broward County with the Everglades, adjacent to the Everglades. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a lot of planning on what was to be called Blockbuster Park. And it was to have a baseball stadium and a big arena and a mm -hmm. huge entertainment retail place and a lot of hotels and, uh, and golf courses and, you know, Olympics facilities and all, kind, all kinds of stuff. It was really a very ambitious project. And, right. Uh, then you may remember the what happened with Blockbuster is that, is that they he Wayne got pulled in with uh, Sumner Redstone when when the whole Paramount when Sumner Redstone's National Amusements wanted to buy Paramount and mm -hmm. and uh, Viacom uh, it was all it was a, and then Blockbuster it was a big it was a big uh, mashup of these different companies to to to, to buy. Um, Paramount and Viacom. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, Wayne 
thought he could get out of doing that deal, but he ended up doing that deal because he always wanted to sell Blockbuster. Sure. So uh, it's a more complicated story about how that went down, but uh, um, uh, he uh, <laughs> um, he did eventually have to give up that project because Sumner Redstone, the Blockbuster Park project, because Sumner Redstone looked at him and said, so why do I want to build this over here? And here's these state, these are stadiums and stuff. And uh, who owns these teams? And he says, well, I do. Yeah. Why do I want to, why would we want to build the state, all this stuff for you and your teams? Yeah. And they had to walk away from that project. I um, see. So it didn't happen, but there were a lot of people from the industry, our architects and stuff. We had big, huge planning sessions um, with just about everybody. And there, so there's a, there was a lot of uh, uh, interest in this topic of how do you blend uh, entertainment uh, with with uh, other other thing other things other anchors. Sure. I mean, Disney was doing it with their downtown Disney or the uh, and, and Universal had City Walk. Um, so they had the, the theme park anchor along with the entertainment retail. We understand that, mm -hmm. but. There's, why can't we anchor retail with this other thing like sports? Right. Um, you know, right. Those, you know, all kinds of kinds of other anchors. Yeah. Uh, which led, you know, eventually to a lot of other. Pro it led it led ULI to get interested in the topic too. And there were, there were a couple of books that I contributed to about building urban entertainment centers. It was a real. There was a real active in the in the nineties, a real active interest in UEC urban entertainment centers. Um, or there was a it was almost like a I think I had a sidebar in that book about acronym soup. We called it a lot of different things, you know, yeah. um, with different initials. Yeah, but it was a very it's a very hot topic, and and yeah. I, you know. I was part of founding a, a council within ULI about for entertainment development, and then ULI ever did a did a a conference every year about entertainment development. Uh, and one year it was in Beverly Hills, the Beverly Hilton. Then it was the next year in New York at the New York Hilton. Go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So and there was a lot of just a lot of interest in, in how do you how do you do that? Yeah. It led, it led to a lot of other projects. I mean, one of which we will talk about is LA Live, mm. which was probably the, the best combination of entertainment with the sports anchors. Or sure. well, also too, I guess, the convention center was right there next to it, so mm. that was also an anchor. Um, so yeah, we worked on worked on planning that uh, for, from the beginning. So there 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 became a real momentum. Mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, understood. Uh, that Blockbuster Park project, it, it brings up um, a point, it, which is that uh, it, you must have seen, I mean, now probably thousands of these projects that have been planned, you know, since the beginning of your career. Are there any other memorable ones or like ones that have either been built or ones that you would have liked to see built, been built that uh, that weren't? Well, that, that's sort of one of the interesting things, right? Is, is yeah. sometimes the stuff that doesn't get built could, could could have been, yeah, super interesting. Blockbuster Park would have been super interesting, and yeah. that would if it would have happened, it would have led to Wayne buying out the Paramount Parks. You know, um, that was part of one of the equations mm -hmm. was to buy back Paramount Parks, but because he liked the theme park business, um, but. Uh, uh, there, yeah. So the one, the, you know, sometimes you learn by your failures. Right? Yeah, yeah. More than your successes. But yeah. uh, uh, I think Blockbuster Park certainly was. Um, I thought. I think. I think Metreon uh, was it was it was a was a kind of a missed opportunity because of hmm. uh, it, it was it wasn't to be a straight ahead retail entertainment development. It was to sort of help Sony try to forge this new. Uh, to join the industry, mm -hmm. which they're doing now, by the way, with IP, but that's another subject. But uh, right. uh, 
the third group is, is, is handling it now and have, having some successful rollout of IP uh, products in, L, in the LDE industry. Mm -hmm. um, so in, the question was, in, was favorite? Favorite? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just any favorite or memorable projects that you've worked on that that have either been built or not built um, that you'd have liked to see built, um, or, or just you know ones that have been built um, that you. There's a couple of good stories. I mean, like I I really enjoyed working on Fiesta Texas in in San Antonio, which ended up becoming part of uh, Six Flags as well. Mm -hmm. Was originally a joint venture of a um, uh, a big insurance company, USAA. Mm -hmm. uh, they own the land in in based in San Antonio, um, and uh, they had Opry Land as an operator. And it was this quarry site, this very unusual what the hell do you do with this site? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <clears throat> that was that was very fun to find because it was it was it was kind of a unique development. But yeah. Um, um, let me just see what these these notes. I, I think I'd like to talk about well a couple of things, but um, uh, the development in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Tell uh, tell you a story about uh, well Singapore and Malaysia, Southern Malaysia is is you know kind of an extended market area, and yeah. I looked at Singapore for many many different groups um because it was a very attractive marketplace and mm. uh, there was there was no way you could develop a theme park because uh, no matter how bad singapore wanted it eventually it would go back to the urban development authority mm. and they would say okay uh it's you want 200 acres it's it's uh it's uh 200 a square foot for the land or something yeah. Yeah. just and, and kill any theme park yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, this, and, and so, but finally, we were working with Singapore Tourism Authority, and uh, um, which is a very progressive group, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted this in, in the worst way, but eventually came up with this idea of how do you send tourism to Singapore? And, and one of the big notions, of course, was uh, was casinos. Yeah. Although, you didn't say casino. You didn't say the word casino. You said integrated resort, right? right. Yeah. Um, and that led to to two projects being approved. Um, one was to be one project was to have bolted into it a lot of family entertainment, mm -hmm. and the other was to have big convention facilities. Yeah. So Marina Bay Sands was granted uh, the. Uh, uh, the rights for, for the property in Marina Bay, mm -hmm. uh, it's Las Vegas Sands, mm -hmm. uh, property in Marina Bay, and that had a you know, million square foot convention center and a lot of, uh, and a great shopping center and stuff too. And uh, other things, a cultural, uh, changeable cultural attraction. Um, and then the other, the, the uh, second one was on Sentosa Island, was given to the Malaysian group, Genting, which had a casino up in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. And uh, they recruited uh, Universal Studios to build a theme park. Mm. Uh, just licensed. That's the only one that Universal did was just a license uh, yeah. to a group to own. Um, and it's a very compact site for Universal. It's unlike the other Universal. Yeah. Yeah, but um, they it's the only it's the only way you were able to get a, a theme park built in in uh, in Singapore is yeah bolted onto a, a casino project which sure the economic engine to me at work right sure sure um, so that was that was pretty interesting because it involved a real far sighted uh, tourism development strategy yeah. The other uh, big tourism development strategy we all involved with was, was Malaysia, the adjacent country. Mm. When uh, we started working with um, the big sovereign wealth trust uh, for uh, called Kazan, Kazan mm. Sinan, 
uh, for for um, for Malaysia. Not the not the one. There's another controversial sovereign wealth trust that was pretty bogus mm -hmm. in Malaysia. And you've probably read about it. Um, yeah. For, a couple of degrees and stuff like that too. Yep. It was it was a, a lot. It was a it was a, a way for certain uh, people, including the former president, to take a lot of money out. Yeah. But Kazan is very super legit. I mean, the best and the brightest in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, we helped them figure out a, a tourism plan because they own this huge several thousand acre property in the south, or twenty thousand acres, I think. Um, at the very south, southern tip, just across the causeway from Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, and they had all these grand plans uh, for that. Um, and there's an example of things that we wanted to make work. We wanted to make we wanted to make Singapore and Southern Malaysia into kind of a theme park hub. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the big big picture. So we got Legoland in there, mm -hmm. uh, and we were talking to. Uh, Village Roadshow and a bunch of others about projects in that southern section, mm -hmm. and even uh, even Disney uh, mm -hmm. to look at that southern section. Um, and these projects, we, you know, we studied them in detail, did a lot of planning, did a lot of design work, and and uh, ultimately didn't work. I mean, we got Pinewood Studios out of England and uh, Legoland and and. Uh, some other some other development there, but but we the vision was for it to be um, quite a bit more. I see, I see. So um, those are those are some that Kazana thing was it was something we were hoping would be a a, a bit uh, more robust. But uh, mm -hmm. you see if it, any else on my notes here that I, I would want to share. Uh, there's one interesting story about the theme park industry in Australia, yep. which is that uh, there was there was this very in the heyday of development in the 80s in Australia, there was a, there were several property developers that just went up like a rocket, you know, just did yep. stuff. One was called Ariadne, and I can't remember the other one, but uh, Ariadne had a 500-acre <clears throat> property just above Surfer's Paradise in, in, mm -hmm. in, that, in you know, the Gold Coast of Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, so I started working with them to figure out what could be on that property. And they were, st they were starting a deal with uh, Dino De Laurentiis who was a, you know, a, a movie producer. Mm -hmm. And he had built a studio in North Carolina, movie mm -hmm. studio. And they wanted him to build a studio in, in this property mm -hmm. in, down in, uh, in outside of Surfer's Paradise. And so we did a big plan. You know, so, how, okay, let's do a studio park next to it. What, what would that be and how would we do that? Because it was just sort of a bare bones studio, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we start we started talking um, and planning that, and then Ariadne, which, as I said, went up like a rocket, mm -hmm. also came down like a rocket, um, and uh, you know that was that was the end of that. At the same time, I was doing a lot of things with Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Warner Brothers about about this, uh, and they knew about it. This deal and. Uh, in uh, in uh, Service Paradise, mm -hmm. and, and they had a relationship with Village Roadshow, mm -hmm. so they got Village Roadshow to look at that property. And Village Roadshow and Warner Brothers ended up building Warner Brothers Movie World in in Australia, um, and uh, then Sea World went on to buy. I mean, uh, uh, Village Roadshow went on to buy Sea World, and they made a, a theme park group. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know they're very active in, in very, a lot of different markets. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of interesting how that came together, sort of a, a backdoor story, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That is. Then, 
Yeah. So what happened? So that land was owned by Ariadne, you said, and did it just go over to them? Did it go over to to Warner Brothers? And exactly how what details that Village worked out to get control of it all, but they did, mm -hmm. uh, and then and they built built the park. Another interesting interesting story. I did a <laughs> the study for that said, you know, in those days, these are different. These are old old numbers. Yeah. yeah, you can build a park for a hundred million dollars and get a million people. Mm -hmm. You can build a park for two hundred million dollars because the market was only so big. Right. You can build a park for two hundred million dollars, you get a million one. Yeah. So, I see. Yeah. I see. So, they, so, so they built, you know, a fairly um, modest uh, park in the sure. uh, when it's, you know, it's it's grown over time. And yeah. it's, it's still it's still a, a, Australia is a is a limited market. Yeah. It gets uh, about a million, million five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, 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 as you look back over all of these projects, it, it, is there anything that um, sticks out to you in terms of like lessons learned, you know, or, or from from either the successes or the failures, like you know what to do, what not to do for for developers or anyone you know, in the theme park or I entertainment industry? Yeah, you know, I mean, there's so many lessons, Juan. I don't know where to start. Okay. Uh, I, I, I will say, you know, there's some, just just to talk a little bit about what it takes today, mm -hmm. what, what's really important today is, um, I think there's a few things. One is, is, is this, compared to the early days of the sophistication of the product. Um, you know, the, the influence and the importance of intellectual property usage, mm -hmm. how do you do that, getting the right deal and 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 having having the branding power, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, that's something we 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 talk about a lot. Um, you know, of course there's bigger, bigger and badder coasters, um, yeah. but, you know, much more immersive things and and uh, interactive uh uh, uh, both in in theme parks, of course, and but also in LBA with uh, LBE with all of the, you know, the the immersive art projects, art artainment, right. and all, all of, all of that is is so pervasive now. Mm. The, the next thing I'd say is, is so you got you got you got to you got to know how to how to how to work with that, and you have to have your eye on that at all times. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there are certain things that are that are just givens now. I mean, you have to be anything you develop now has to be planning for the next generation of tech. Mm. And there's all kinds of things, you know, in terms of ticketing and you know, do you even have a gate in the future? Epic Universe, you know, through Universal might not might not even have a, a standardized gate. It, it, mm. So you, you know, there's sophisticated programs for dealing with that and in uh, uh, gamification mm -hmm. and, uh, you know all, all that that entails uh, mm -hmm. and personalization you know cut mass customization right um, mm -hmm. all those things are just, just critically important you it's like it, it's no longer a debate to say that you got to be planning on technology and, and you got you got to be you got to be sustainability is the other given right you, mm -hmm. um, you have to be the, the, the best you can be in all of that. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's super important is that we've learned that, did, that Walt taught us back in the 60s, but we didn't pay attention, was that, you know, it's much more uh, economically strong to build a destination than just a project. Mm -hmm. And, and if you look at, I mean, it, it, it really is all about destination creation now. So if you're talking about a theme park, mm -hmm. how do you how do you uh, extend that? Well, the standard formula is you need two gates so that the customer perceives it's it's a you know it's a weekend or it's a it's a multi day visit, not right. just drive to, um, and you you know you need something for people to do. When it's not during the daytime and they're in the theme park, yeah. Uh, so you need the the uh, entertainment retail component, and you need that you need to have the overnight accommodations so that mm -hmm. so that you get you capture that as I said several days versus several hours right. per, 
right? Yeah. Dramatically yeah. different. Dramatically yeah. different when you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, however, dramatically more expensive mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. So uh, the other given today is any of these projects are of such scale that they must be, must be public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, billions of dollars mm -hmm. and, uh, and a great story for, uh, for uh, the local government, I mean, in terms of job creation and yeah. impacts and, and, uh, and image and tourism to this area. It's a, it's a great story to tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you really are building these mega projects, you, you have to be very uh, upfront about telling your story. Sure, yeah. Understood. I think those are those are very powerful uh, trends right now. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. I mean, I I think we covered a lot here. Yeah, we, yeah, we didn't. We <laughs> didn't. The only thing, I mean, the topic we didn't, we you and I discussed that we might want to touch would be uh, cultural stuff. Um, yeah. But I've just got you know some projects that that are. Man, I don't know if it, if it adds to the, to the conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would love to hear about them. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple of cool stories. Um, probably maybe the most notable cultural project that I did was, and I worked on it for 10 years, was the Getty Center in Los Angeles. Um, and what was interesting about it was, you know, they had $8 billion in the bank. Mm -hmm. And I first started talking to them. They, they'd hired Richard Meyer as their architect. They bought that 800 acres in Brentwood, right? Yeah. Hanging uh, in expensive real estate in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, and they, uh, uh, so the, the issue wasn't, you know, feasibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and they wanted to make it free. Um, and uh, they were going to spend a billion dollars in those days on, on this project. This yeah. is the late 80s and early 90s. Um, so we were, we were working on what, what we, we were brought in to, to sort of be the, watch out, be the guardian of the, of the visitor experience, right? Mm -hmm. And Richard Meyer, brilliant architect and his team were laying it all out and they had a, they had a scheme for how it worked, you know, progression, a historical progression of art from the Renaissance to more recently. And they had these different pavilions that it would, that, that, pro, that, that, progression would take place in as you went from building to building. Mm -hmm. But then there's things like, well, we want it to be a good visitor experience. So so we want it to, to uh, uh, we, we don't want the visitor to wait more than five minutes for anything. Mm. And so we had to find out where the bottlenecks were and stuff like that. So we built s several, uh, I don't know, we ran it 50 or 60 times. We built a big visitor simulation model mm. that, how how would people proceed through the, the place? How long would they where the dwells were? Mm. How long, you know all the different galleries and the different activities and and uh, that was really fun. That was that was that was different. Yeah, for us it wasn't feasibility, as I said. It yeah. was it wasn't market research. It was you know how do how do these things work? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and so during the course of the, we were sitting at the table and planning and everything. So the, the museum itself was going to be perched on top of the hill, 800 acres, mm -hmm. but it was all hillside. They had to give the gauge 780 acres uh, uh, back to the city um, uh, because it, they, they just needed to be down at ground level and then up on the top of the hill for the, for the facilities. The ground level is where the visitors arrive and parking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The question is, how are, they, how are you going to get about three quarters of a mile from the parking up to the top? Mm -hmm. how, how, how are you going to get that? And um, how are you going to get people up? And mm -hmm. we talked about that. And and the best answer I got from them was, well, we're going to use, we're going to, we've got this roadway. We'll, we'll, we'll drive them up on buses. Mm -hmm. I said, you can drive smelly old buses in this billion dollar best museum in the world place. Yeah. It's not going to work. And and I said, well, let me, I bring somebody in. And I knew this guy who was a, the sort of the West Coast 
guy for Intamin mm -hmm. rides. Yep. He was a European ride company, but he was based in California. So I, I brought him in and in, introduced him to them and said, you know, Intamin got their start in Europe building funiculars up yep. in, in, in mountainous areas. So, so we can build a funicular here, we ran. And, and so, and, and the sort of the, the Getty people were shocked because they were very art people. Right. Um, and they thought that was Disney, you know, yeah. bad, bad word. So, uh, but eventually it, it, it made so much sense that it, it came around. And, and so now we have the funicular. That's a very, you know, for noble, notable yeah. part of, of, uh, of the Getty experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that was that was a, that was fun. Um, California Academy of Sciences, um, maybe. So, uh, how how we've involved how have we been involved in cultural projects, and museum projects? Well, the truth is, the Getty was an outlier because we don't usually get involved in art museums. Art museums, right. by and large, uh, across the country, are are are, ba are based on. Uh, Economics based on contributions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Not some, and, but other things like museums, like science centers, natural history museums, things like that are uh, much more uh, visitor experience oriented and earned income mm -hmm. oriented compared to contribution uh, and becoming more so. And so, and, and the, more and more of the industry is creeping into those kind of products. So we're actually always been more involved in those kind of projects so one of which was california academy of sciences in golden gate park in san francisco so they had a old old tired facility that was really there's always these different buildings that have sort of been built on top of each other to get to 400,000 square feet or whatever it was um and uh i think there were 17 or 21 different buildings that are sort of bonded together mm -hmm. and uh um, you know, they've been rattling up over a number of years for earthquakes. So they had to really redo the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I got involved in that project um, to, to plan that. Mm -hmm. And they brought a famous architect in, uh, Renzo Piano, mm -hmm. um, which uh, to build a spectacular building, which highlights another thing in the in the museum cultural business is that a lot of times museum boards get infatuated with star architects right star architects yeah um and the and, and the building and the look of the building becomes more important than what happens inside sure that's something you really have to be careful with um because sometimes you get these extraordinary buildings and in, in the museum isn't much right so mm -hmm. So with the Getty, I told you we did, our focus was on what happens inside. Mm -hmm. um, and with same, same with California Academy of Sciences, besides, you know, doing the, sort of the overall numbers for the place and mm -hmm. you know, with a big expanded facility, um, we, we did a, a, a lot of work on trying to, to develop the program. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how, how did that work? Um, yeah. And and uh, that you know I think they did a spectacular job. They also had to close things down for a couple of years, and so they had to build a temporary museum somewhere. And how would that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going back to the Getty, um, how how was that uh, that work manifested? Like you said that you did, you tried to figure out crowd control issues and um, spacing people out. Um, was it you know? In the end, um, was it like a matter of just spacing things out more? Like, how did they actually reflect your recommendations at the Getty? Well, it, ha it, it had to do with flow. <clears throat> um, uh, so, so uh, it, you know, I think we, you know, going upstairs and stuff mm -hmm. like that can, can be can be problematic. So you gotta. And be careful how you how you do that. So we, we but the the alignment it had to, it changed a little bit because we were part of the planning team. Mm -hmm. so it changed some of the alignment of how you progress through. So as I said, it's there's two Getty museums. One is the Getty Villa out on mm -hmm. the coast. 
between yeah. Malibu and then there's this one. Yeah. The coast is antiquity, so it's uh, up to the Renaissance. Right. And then the Getty Center, the one, the one in Brentwood that we're talking about, is is re Renaissance forward. So uh, there was the there was a there was a building for the Renaissance, and then there was 1600 1800 uh, mm -hmm. uh, focus, and then there's decorative arts, and then there's the more modern. Mm -hmm. so they don't get too modern. Yeah, uh, Getty doesn't get too modern, but um, so yeah, so uh, it 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 had to do with uh, how do you just how do you pace people through the building? Mm -hmm. I see. I don't. I don't, I don't, I'm a little foggy on all of the answers to, to yeah, yeah. Sure, the, sure. the tweaks that we, that we did, but there, there weren't any number of them. And it was really fun to be part of planning that, that, that process. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a brilliant development with that, with that outdoor garden, spectacular yeah. stuff there. I see. Um, so, uh, one other uh, thing that I would say was, was that, uh, Maybe this is a category of didn't quite happen, uh, but from what we thought was a great opportunity mm -hmm. was, is the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village in uh, Dearborn, Michigan. So we went in with the team to look at the Henry Ford Museum, which was classic museum. Henry Ford was amazing acquirer of, of objects and things. Mm -hmm. I mean, so in, in the Henry Ford Museum, you had you know, of course, all kinds of cars, but also steam engines and mm. you know, all this other stuff. In the adjacent outdoor park, mm -hmm. outdoor historic park, was Greenfield Village, where he had re, you know, rebuilt and he actually bought um, uh, uh, these, these these homes and buildings and stuff, and he sort of recreated them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so we were looking at those two sort of big how do you how do you make them better uh and matt remaster plan uh some right. of that. and uh but also um in the course of that we started talking with them about third attraction which was they were rebuilding the famous um uh, factory site called the river rouge plant mm -hmm. it's like the postcard for uh uh World War II industrial America, you know, with big smokestacks belching mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah, it was, it was it was the classic. They brought in iron ore on the river, and then they process it out uh, on the one side, and out comes a car on the other side. Yeah. It was food, right? Um, but it was being rebuilt. As I said, it was it was a, it was a it was an environmental disaster. Um, it was being rebuilt as like the cleanest factory in the world. And Ford had hired this famous um, uh, environmental architect guy to, to do it. And, and they did a remarkable job of capturing it. So we, we ended up being asked to figure out what a, how, would, how do we tell that story, a visitor center, how many tour mm -hmm. and stuff. So that was a third thing. So mm -hmm. one of the big ideas we had was, was you know, Detroit doesn't really have a theme park and and it doesn't have uh any big strong visitor attractions not, not mm -hmm. like other places yeah you could bundle these three things together and make it sort of a cultural destination because they had some additional land yeah you, know, you, needed, you needed some of those other destination components right hotels mm -hmm. um, and i thought that was really uh, a, a great opportunity mm -hmm. i was hopeful uh, that we could do something with that because we were also working with Ford at the same time on uh on uh, what became Ford Field the, the mm -hmm. football stadium downtown Detroit mm -hmm. which was, you know in those days was a pretty rocky place um, right. um but they were building the Co-America baseball stadium next door to the site for Ford Field mm -hmm. uh, and then you know a couple blocks away was a big indoor concert theater place uh, mm -hmm. Been being, being refurbished, and we thought the idea that you could build a whole district uh, uh, around that and tie it together and sort of be a, mm -hmm. a redevelopment of, of some of the rehabilitation of the downtown right. blues trouble. Um, and, and 
because in the other it was the who was the pizza guy there was a pizza guy that was making some of the investment in, in, in some of that down there little little caesar's pizza mm -hmm. but i guess the ford family and, and they didn't get along that well or something but um uh we had a, we had a scheme to make a whole district out of that and i thought that was a really good idea again one of those things that didn't quite come together sure. until more recently matter of fact uh, about four or five years ago i was back in detroit for a uli meeting and uh and uh, the they built the the hockey arena mm -hmm. they had been, started to redo this whole district so oh. hopefully it's it, 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 it's coming together now yeah wait, wait, so what do you think is you know um I, i've been I've been in your shoes um, many times as well, where you make a lot of recommendations to the client or, you you know, you present the findings and it seems right. there's this big disconnect between the results and findings and what they actually end up doing. Um, do you <laughs> think it's a, a lot of times just because it's kind of too far ahead of its time or, you know, do you have any insight into why that happens? Like it, it, it doesn't, actually happen why it doesn't actually happen um the way it's probably a different story every time right? yeah. I think it's a, um you know some sometimes you know it 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 is a little too much the big picture might be a little too much to bite off so you need to be able to stage it yeah how, how, how do you eventually get there mm -hmm. and, and sometimes uh, you know the market isn't quite ready for it sure um uh, and, and then, and then, you know, and then, and then deals change. It's real estate, so deals change, and people exit and go on. Yeah. To whatever, but uh, right. I mean, I always, is, being in this business, I've, I've always enjoyed as economists to, to, you know, the opportunity to get a little bit creative mm -hmm. about what could be done. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it works. But I mean, that was a. For me, that was that was the most fun part of the job was not mm -hmm. just cranking out another. Okay, you're going to get 2.2 million people to come to your theme park, right? <laughs> but, but if we did all these other things, it could be something bigger or better. And sure. Just, yeah. And that, that was that was really fun. But mm -hmm. you know, as you know, in this business, we get calls from people who have uh, have a big have an idea. Have a big idea. Maybe they don't have much else behind that. But mm -hmm. so you, you sort of have to have to hear them out. Yeah. And see what see where it goes. Um, yeah. As I said, once you know, I I, I get all kinds of wild ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, sometimes they're crazy. Sometimes they they could maybe you could see the way how they could work with a little uh, readjustments, but you know. I always think you need to take the call, yep. all those people, because maybe there's the next, next Walt Disney out there. Yeah, yeah. Brand, old brand new idea or something. Yeah, crazy. exactly. Right. It, it, any other uh, parting thoughts or or comments? You feel like he? No, I think we I think it, we covered the, the the topics that we we hoped to, um, more or less. Um, I I. I, I enjoy talking with you and, uh, um, you know, it's been a fun, a fun go of my of 53 years for me. Yeah. Business. Yeah. Well, maybe, uh, we could do a part two, uh, sometime and maybe drill down, um, a, a little more deeply into some of these projects. Um, it, it seems like, you know, we, we covered a lot of these, um, in a very short amount of time. So top level. Yeah. Just the top yeah. level. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> well, happy holidays. Um and happy holidays, Juan. Good yeah. to talk to you. Take care of those babies. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. Bye.